Welcome back. We're continuing our discussion about ALS with Dr. Nicole Clark, a neurologist from St. Peter's Health, so thank you for sticking around. So Dr. Clark, how common is ALS? So ALS affects about 6,000 people in the U.S. every year that they're diagnosed. Um, that means that there are about 20,000 Americans living with ALS at any time and about 150,000 worldwide. When someone is diagnosed with ALS, how much time do they tend to have? What's the life expectancy there? It varies greatly. Um, the, the average in what we read in textbooks is an average of three to five years after getting the diagnosis or after those symptoms have become apparent. But you know, even 10% of people live up to 10 years, 20% of people live more than five years. So there aren't any definitive numbers. Okay. And uh, we talked a little bit too about that there's no cure for ALS, but what are some of the treatments that people with ALS can get? Sure. Well, we actually have two medications now that we use. So from a medical standpoint, that's pretty exciting. It, it Daravone was uh, just released last summer and it actually slows the progression of symptoms and slows the functional decline and the ability to do things. So that's very exciting medication for us. Also there's Rilazole that is, has been around for several years that helps people live longer. So from a medication standpoint, there is no cure and there's nothing that stops the progression, but we can slow it down some now. There are lots of other treatments that we talk about in clinic. First, it's talking about how do you treat their problems breathing? How do you treat problems swallowing? And there are lots of things we can do to alleviate the symptoms and help people function better with their disease. Okay, and uh, we talked a little bit about the research being done. Um, can you expound upon that a little bit? What are we looking into when it comes to ALS? Mm -hmm. So in research, we're looking at a lot of um, genetics and we're, so ways that it's passed down. Are there triggers that we can find? We're also looking for better ways to diagnose it. We talked about how difficult it is to confirm a diagnosis, and we look for biomarkers, which are things that we can test in your blood or in your spinal fluid. And then, of course, we're also doing lots of tests for treatment. There are lots of stem cell therapy uh, tests going on right now around the country and different medications that may slow down the disease. Okay, so you mentioned triggers, and we talked a little bit before the break about family history maybe being one. Mm -hmm. um, is age also a factor? Um, there is a common age. You know, typically, um, typically people are between 40 and 70 when they're diagnosed. Um, it's rare to be diagnosed earlier or later than that. Can happen. Um, certainly Caucasian descent are more likely than other ethnic or racial groups. Okay. And um, also we find some environmental factors. Actually, people in the military are almost twice as likely to develop ALS as non-military. And that was actually gonna be my next question, the environmental factors. Uh, what are some of those? Sure, well, we look at military service um, as, as a factor, certainly. And um, otherwise, it, that's the main one. Oh, okay. And aren't athletes also, I know this disease is named after Lou Gehrig, who was yeah. an athlete. Are, are they more susceptible to ALS than other folks? There's some question. It's not as well defined, okay. though, as the military part. Okay. Is ALS contagious? No, it's not. Okay. It's not. Um, if you have a loved one or a friend with ALS, you cannot catch it. There are 10% of people uh, that have the form of ALS that is genetic and can be passed down to their children in their genes, but it's not contagious from person to person. Okay. We talked a little bit earlier, too, about some of the different treatments. Are there clinics or specific facilities that people with ALS go to for their treatments? Excellent question. Yes, there are. There are ALS clinics. They tend to be at university settings. Um, for instance, uh, the one I trained at at University of Utah is a multidisciplinary clinic. 
And that can be really nice because it's people, not just neuromuscular experts, but people who focus on just treating ALS as a, a subset of the disease. And they bring in physical, occupational, speech therapy, respiratory therapy, all into one clinic to see everyone in that same day. And nutrition, isn't that also something that someone with ALS has to think about? Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. Um, nutrition is a very important part. We know that being aggressive and making sure that people with ALS have enough nutrition, even if it's requiring a feeding tube, is really important and helps prolong their ability to do things and keeps their strength. Okay, great. Uh, earlier in the show, we talked with Paul Tess, whose wife and mother both yes. had ALS. And he talked a little bit about how they were able to cope with having the disease. From a medical perspective, do you have any advice to close us out here of what you would say to help folks who have been diagnosed cope with that? Sure. What I would say is the most important advice you have is to prepare. And you can prepare, even with such a devastating diagnosis. You can prepare financially. You can prepare emotionally. And you can prepare your plans to take control over what you want to have done to you. Talk to your doctor, talk to your family about whether you want assistance breathing, whether you want assistance with a feeding tube, and be open with those decisions. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much for your time and your expertise you for me. and for being with us today. And I would like to thank Paul Tess for sharing his story and joining us this morning as well. And thank you for joining us. We hope you'll see, we hope to see you again next week. In the meantime, stay fit, stay well, and stay healthy for life with Healthy Living for Life. Have a great week. Healthy Living for Life is brought to you by Mountain Pacific Quality Health. We'd love to hear from you. If you have suggestions for future programs, visit our website at mpqhf.org or call us at 406-443-4020. You can also catch us on YouTube by visiting our website and clicking on the YouTube icon. Special thanks to Fire Tower Coffee House and Roasters. Production facilities provided by Video Express Productions.